Friday the 24th of November today. And I'm not sure if any of you guys have checked your phones. If you haven't, please don't. But the story that's trending number one at the moment is Oxford Circus. We've got an Irish audience. Everybody knows somebody in Oxford Circus. You must be worried. I'll tell you what's happened. Allegedly, there's been an attack. Shots were fired. Hundreds of people were seen running down Oxford Circus. I know what you're thinking. Not again. Not another attack. And somebody like me, I'm thinking, I hope the guy doesn't have a name like mine, Yusuf Omar. The thing is, nothing happened in Oxford Circus today. There's over 100,000 tweets, and yet the police can't find any weapons, any suspects, or anybody even injured. But do you know what did happen today? Over 200 people were killed in a terror attack in the Sinai in Egypt. But that's not trending as number one. And the thing is, in the old days, we could blame big men in news media organizations in New York and in London for deciding what were the top five stories of the day. But today, we have to blame what's trending. And what's trending is determined by algorithms. And algorithms are determined by us and the stories that we share and what we talk about and what we write about and what we do with our mobile phones. And only we can take responsibility for changing what is important and what stories we should be prioritizing. And we can do it using our mobile phones. The mobile device is the singular most powerful thing we may ever own. It's got more computing power than the Apollo missions that took us to the moon. Since 9-11, it hasn't been big broadcast cameras that have been documenting the biggest stories of our lives. It's been people with mobile devices that have been finding amazing stories. The mainstream media, traditional media, are designed to go for the most universal story, generalizations, but it's mobile phones that get to the specifics. I'm a mojo, a mobile journalist. That means I shoot, I edit, I produce entirely with my mobile phone. I travel a lot. Sometimes I don't even know where I'm going. All I know is that I must find stories which the world needs to hear that are hard to reach in difficult to access places. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent my entire life. And I believe we are all becoming foreign correspondents in our own right. We all have mobile phones and we are all sharing stories all the time. And I believe we have a responsibility to do so, especially when we see the very best and the very worst of humanity. We have a responsibility to document it. And I believe it's already happening. When we look at the witness accounts of the uh, young black men that are gunned down in the United States of America and the evidence that is used in these Black Lives Matter court cases, it's often videos shot on mobile phones that give us... He was trying to get out his ID and his wallet out his um, pocket and he let the officer know that he was... He had a firearm and he was reaching for his wallet. Grenfell Tower in the UK, massive apartment block that caught on fire. In a young woman's most dire moments, she was trapped high up. What did she do with her final moments of life? She did a Snapchat video and a Facebook Live. And why, why do we do this? We do this because it's our generation's way of engaging with the world. We've swiped right through Tinder and found our next love. We've scrolled down on LinkedIn and found our next job. For us, sharing is empowering. We've started revolutions in Egypt. And for our generation, from the very day we were born, we have been thrust in front of the cameras. We've had digital cameras and soon mobile devices almost immediately after our birth. I have been in front of the camera. My father and mother have been taking pictures of me since the day I was born. Even my first uh, hanging out my dad's dental surgery was caught on camera. Something I haven't told anybody though, when I was 14 years old and I was getting picked up from school by my mother and all the other mums were around and all the other kids were around and I was there too, Mrs. Tipper told my mum that I wasn't coping, that I wasn't able to read and write as well as the other kids in the class. What Mrs. Tipper didn't understand was that we were a generation that were changing the way we communicate. Yes, we don't read as much as the previous generation, but that doesn't mean we don't engage and communicate as much. We use our camera as a way of engaging with the world, of sharing. 
As I said, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I wanted to cover wars and natural disasters. And every news organization said, you don't have enough gray hairs on your head. You're not as experienced. You're not old enough. We're cutting back on budgets. We're not sending as many foreign correspondents around the world. So I decided to do it anyway. I didn't need them. In 2010, with a backpack full of old t-shirts, a head full of young dreams, and a little mobile device, I hitchhiked from South Africa to Syria, from Durban to Damascus, up 12,000 kilometers for three months, telling stories just with a little uh, camera. handheld, the audio was terrible, and nobody cared. We were entering a generation where what we trusted was real and raw and an arm's length away and somebody telling you exactly how they felt. And for me, this trip was an ability to tell a different story of the African continent, that it wasn't this dark, scary place, that in fact it was full of hope and opportunity and I had a fantastic time and there was nothing for me to be afraid of. In 2012, I tried to apply the same selfie storytelling, selfie journalism style to news gathering. And an ammunitions depot had exploded in the Congo. They keep weapons in the middle of civil populations in case there's an uprising. And in this instance, this ammunitions depot had set a light. And for three days, it was like the biggest fireworks display you'd ever seen. And this time, just like how I'm wearing a camera on my face right now, I've got a flashing light and that's a camera. This time I strapped a camera to my head, and I wanted people to feel like what it was like to be walking through that kind of a place. It's quite scary walking. It's, it's essentially like walking through a, a mine field. Around me is ammunition. Some of it's still alive, uh, most of it has exploded, and everything's just been flattened in every direction. Uh, nothing's changed. If, if anything, the situation is far worse than before. We're about two kilometers in every direction, everything's just flattened. Gave you a sense of not like, hey, I'm coming to you live from the front lines of Congo. No, it was far more human and intimate, and you're able to speak directly to the camera and look at people in the eye and tell them exactly how I felt to be there on the ground. This is a dramatic version of selfie journalism, but selfie journalism can happen everywhere in every community all the time to give us access to hard to reach stories. In 2014, I was smuggled into Syria with a group of surgeons that were building a hospital in the province of Darkush in Idlib. Uh, this was one of the most horrific experiences I've ever had in my life, and, and this time I started taking, just like how I'm live right now on Facebook, even though they told us not to record this. Uh, I'll record my talk. Just like how I'm live right now on Facebook, I was able to use live broadcasts to broadcast bomb by bomb what I was experiencing on the ground in Syria. Just seconds ago, we saw a child, uh, basically a car came screaming in here, blood pouring out. There was a child, he's been shot just below the heart. At the moment, we understand it was some sort of an accident. It was an 11-year-old accidentally shot dead by his father. He was cleaning his gun. I'm just getting word, uh, an update on the child that has been shot. It's coming through now. We tried to personify this hospital. 
I wanted to do this my whole life and having done it, I wouldn't want to go even one centimeter closer. That Hatay airport near Antakya crossing the border into Syria on an old tractor. You better move. Uh, there's a lot of armed men that have just arrived at the hospital. Uh, the security situation is definitely uh, deteriorating. This is by far the most uh, scary part of the trip thus far. Uh, we're hearing loud explosions now, not far away from where we're staying. There's definitely an eerie feeling in, in, in my stomach that uh, things are taking a turn for the worse. And things did take a turn significantly for the worse. Um, it's 24 hours after that happened, mortar was firing just a couple hundred meters away from us, and we were evacuated from Syria. The thing is, everybody who I've got close to during my time in Syria has died. This is Nihad. I stayed at Nihad's house, and he evacuated his family to Turkey just so we would have space in his house. I used to ride on the back of his motorcycle every day to the hospital. He was killed a few weeks after we left. This is Safwan. Safwan was a guy, he's just a student, he was my age, he was learning English, and during wartime, he was forced to become a translator to be able to help the doctors, the surgeons, the journalists. He too was killed, and now it's too dangerous for, for conventional journalists to be on the ground, and we're relying almost entirely on the voices of selfie storytellers, like this young girl. Her name is Bana Alabed. She's seven years old, and on a regular basis, with the help of her mother, she live streams on Periscope from East Aleppo at a time when there are no journalists in that area. And this is her voice. At nine, I want to leave. Now it's okay. Oh, bang, bang. Now, of course, that view is not a journalist. Of course, it's not objective and neutral. But that doesn't mean that it's not of value. It's about us having those perspectives, about us having those angles, about us being able to contextualize the voice of a seven-year-old. And somewhere amidst this chaos, she was rescued, and she's now in Turkey. Somebody listened to that selfie storyteller. And I ask you, how many selfie storytellers are we listening to? We've heard today about alcohol abuse and all sorts of problems that are plaguing the society. Maybe if we start tapping into the voices of people who are able to document their most sensitive and emotional stories on their mobile phones, instead of pouring a big broadcast camera onto them, we'll have a better understanding of what's happening in our communities. Since I left Syria, I've dedicated my life to building more mobile storytelling communities, to training people to do what I do, to tell stories with their phones. In South Africa, we took 12 young people, we gave them mobile phones, we trained them up for three months, and we set them off to be able to give us stories and diversify our coverage. In India, we were able to get six students, we trained them up how to use Snapchat, and we had them document the most stressful six weeks of their lives trying to get into university. And we captured their sex lives, politics with their family, all the kind of six drama. Six, six goals. Six ideas. But one objective. And in India, covering rape and sexual abuse. In India, you can't show the face of a rape survivor, even if they want to show their identity, because they get ostracized from their communities, they get thrown out of their societies. We were able to give them a mobile phone and have them swipe through Snapchat and find face filters, but find one that could hide their identity while allowing them to tell their story, while we could still see their eyes, their mouths, their expressions, without having to blur out their faces or show silhouettes. Okay. I was five years old when it happened. And in Europe, we're now working with refugees, and we're trying to change the narrative away from brown men in rubber dinghies arriving on the European coast to actually tell stories of who they are and what they're like. Training this young man from Afghanistan, his name was Uzair, he's now a selfie storyteller, telling us about his fight for education in Serbia. Hello. Hello, guys. My name is Uzair Fekirzada. For us, engagement increases empathy. If we can connect people that don't like refugees with stories from refugees, we can create empathy. But isolation kills it. In India, one community that are not listened to by the mainstream media is waste pickers, people that collect garbage from the streets. So we train them up how to tell stories uh, on Instagram stories. <laughs> Hold down the white button for 10 seconds. 
And the thing is, we heard almost nothing from them. We heard nothing for like literally nine months, we heard nothing, until the Indian government raised the GST taxes, directly impacting the livelihoods of these men. They raised the taxes on recyclable plastics. And out of nowhere, we suddenly started seeing these waste pickers pick up their phones and start sharing stories. And then suddenly we saw the Indian newspapers and TV stations start running with these stories. And just a month ago, the Indian government announced that they were going to reduce the GST taxes on recyclable plastics. So it worked. Somebody listened to the selfie storytellers. Their voices were heard. We are the next billion users. We're here to engage and inform, empowering mobile storytellers to bring about reform. I believe that we don't need satellite trucks. That's a fact. We are infinitely faster and cheaper than that. For me, good storytelling has always been about more voices. And mobile cameras simply means more choices. We have more angles, we have more perspectives, and we have more truth than before. There's a different way of telling stories, and we need to explore it. I don't want to ignore traditional media success, but I believe that we are better than this. I believe that stories are being drowned and conversations are ending. Truth and trust is being lost, but mobile storytelling can mend it. We need to find narratives in the noise. We don't need to conform. Let's identify voices being lost in the storm. See, a lack of media diversity is what's really affecting me. We talk about fake news, but we don't listen to enough real views. Our stories are being drowned and the conversation has ended. Truth and trust can be lost, but mobile storytelling can mend it. Thank you so much.